to drift off with, with yeah, all the daughter, grandchildren. <gasps> yeah. 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 She says you're beautiful. Yeah. But she's a muted Hi, Hello. <laughs> she said he says you're so beautiful. He says she's got grandchildren. She's not that's a beautiful thing. It's good. Through this your all imperfections. Hello, Ali. Hello, Jennifer. Hello, Hello Rachel. Rachel. So nice. I can't to change my you. name. So. Hi, Holly. Hello, hello. I can't change my name. I'm sorry. I'm not. I look like I'm a number there. <laughs> hello, okay. Emily. Emma didn't say hello. Uh, today, the rabbi is not home actually right now. Usually he helps me. And today my little helper in the technology is little Schleimler, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. He came to tell me, mommy, you muted yourself. <laughs> we have to mute. Um, we have to and mute. he turned, actually it's his birthday today. He turned oh. 11 in our Oh my gosh. gosh. He was Happy born in this year. Thank you. The Happy English birthday. Happy Hebrew is the same. Right. Okay. Usually say every 19 okay. years. So uh, yeah, it was born October 29th, the 11th of um, the 11th of uh, Cheshvan. That's beautiful and happy birthday, Rachel. I always say happy birthday to to moms. Because <laughs> the birthday. Right. Yeah. That's right. I surprised him yesterday. Hello, Lisa. I've got to put glasses to see everybody's beautiful faces. Hi, Rachel. I surprised him last Happy night birthday. because, you know, now with the corona, unfortunately, we can't make, um, I can't make him a birthday party with his friends. Right. Hello, Eugenia. Hello, everyone. And hello, Hagit. And I couldn't, uh, and the school doesn't allow him to bring anything. So I wanted to surprise him. So I prepared his big meal. And yet he has a class every day that he joins a yeshiva in uh, back east in New York like with many boys around the world, well, around US and Canada. So the little ones all came in because he was sitting in his room. They all came in quietly and it was so cute to see Lucy and Hannah and my, my three-year-old. They go, shh, you know, they're all, <laughs> I said, don't take off your clothes. Don't leave your, you know, your car seats, everything. Take everything downstairs so he doesn't realize. And then we all came down and they screamed surprise and it was really sweet. So um, Abrahi took a picture. We were on Zoom with the rest of the siblings and she was laughing. She says, it's so cute to see the Mizinik, the youngest one walk in, you know, with his parents. And we were so happy that he was surprised, <laughs> whatever. So anyway, I just thought I should uh, share that with you. Yeah. This Parsha is a very special Parsha, like every Parsha. And there's a lot. I decided to bring the homage. I have the homage with me, so I don't forget what to say, what not to say. But we'll try um, to cover a little bit. We, have to get uh, we do learn about um, Parsha starts with the words lech lecha, go lech, to yourself. Yeah. And yeah. what does go to yourself mean? Hashem said it to Avram. I know I'm sure many of you read things. You know, we want to <coughs> ask some yeah. of the questions. The Parsha also speaks about many things, about Avram, about Sarah. There are many things happening in their lives, obviously. What the Torah is telling us, it's not, that's the only thing that happened when they were alive, Avram and Sarah, and Yitzchak, and Rivka, and, and everybody, you know, they lived for many, many years, and we have some episodes. It's known that Torah is not a history book. Torah in Hebrew is from the word Hora'a. Torah, Hora'a, I know it sounds rhyming. Hora'a in Hebrew means a lesson to teach us something. So Torah really means the, the lesson. We're learning a lesson. Many times we think our Torah is um, you're obviously telling us what to do, but it's a history book. Tell us when Hashem created the world, when Avram, when Adam, Chava, you know, everybody who was there all their lives and so on. Obviously uh, it tells us only the things that we have to learn something from it. It doesn't tell us everything because obviously so many things happen in their lives. And here, it's interesting that the Torah is starting with Avram when Hashem tells Avram, looking here in the Chumash, Lech lecha me'artz go, uh, Lech lecha, go to yourself, which means basically Hashem tells him like, go down, go, and it will be for you. It will be good for you. As the thing of the class is that many times we fall back in order to go forward. Hashem did not tell Avram to fall back. He told him to go, but later on, it seemed like a fall back when he went to Egypt. Soon we'll talk about it. So the first thing that we're learning from it is that the lesson that we have 
that Hashem tells every Yid, because Avram and Sarah were the first Jewish people. It wasn't Noah. Avram was the first Jewish man, and Sarah was the first Jewish lady. And what did Hashem tell them? Lech lecha, go. This is what we have to learn. We always have to be in a state of going, of walking, of going higher and higher and higher, not staying in one place. We always have to grow because we know when we stay in one place, we don't stay in one place. If we don't grow, if we don't go up, we go down. By nature, that's the way life is. And if we don't get better, we go down. If, if you sit home and doing nothing and you did not accomplish anything, you really went back because you could have been so much more successful and, 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 and having so much more done and you said and did nothing. So Shem is telling us, Lech Lecha, go, go. How old was Avraham when Hashem, um, hello to all the new people that joined? Avraham, can you make, sorry, Shlomo, can you make so we can see everyone? Uh, how old was Avraham when Hashem told him, um, now I can put my glasses before I was able to see only myself, I see so many more a ladies joined. That's great. Hello, welcome, welcome, everyone. I'm not going to say all of your names, but it's so beautiful to see everyone. I must say it's nice to see Hilda for the second time because she stopped today at Chabad to get some stuff. So nice to see you again and everyone else who joined. Hashem, uh, Avram was 75 years old. The Avram ben Chamesh Shani, Shemim Shana, Mea Shana. When Hashem spoke, the first time Hashem appeared to Avram, Avram was 75 years old. Now, I'm sure many of us know that Abraham believed in Hashem before he was 75 years old. It says, Abraham, he killed Edbor O. Abraham recognized his creator. Abraham recognized his creator at the age of three, Begil Shalosh. Abraham was a very, very smart man, smart child as a child when he was. And it says that he didn't want to follow what his parents did, what his father did, right? His father, uh, Terach, used to sell idols. And that was the custom in those days that they would have different idols they would worship. And his father had a big shop of that. And Avram was very, he did not think, it didn't make sense to him. So he wanted to understand, uh, Shlaimala, are you recording it? You lost the telephone. He wanted to understand, and he said, it cannot be that the idol created the world. So he got up in the morning, and he saw the sun, and he said, wow, the sun is so powerful, so high, it's hot, you know, everything, it's beautiful, gives light, sun, everything that the sun does, we'll try to make it fast. And probably the sun is the creator of the world. So he was praying for the sun the whole day, and all of a sudden, in the evening, the sun sets. He says, it cannot be. The creator of the world has to be all the time. He says, all things, as, as a child, he was trying to educate himself. He was the only one because everybody else was worshiping idols. And then in the evening was the moon. And then he said, okay, I'll worship the moon and all the stars. And he saw the oceans. He saw all the great things. And he understood on his own. He says, Avram was a very extreme intelligent man, very, very smart person. He understood that the creator of the world is a power, it's a super being, it's the nature, it's something that we don't comprehend, we cannot see, we cannot understand, it's something beyond, because that superpower created the world, and it made the nature the way it is, that the sun gets up in the morning, sets up at night, all the things, the animals, the, 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 the vegetation, everything that goes on, it's got to be controlled by someone, it cannot be just on its own. And we know the story, the known story that the Torah tells us, which obviously it's not just a story, a true thing that happened when Avram was young. One of the times his father asked him to take care of the idol shop because his father had to go to attend for something else. And Avram really wanted to teach his father that you really have to believe in one God. There's no such thing as idols. And there's not many gods, gods of this and God of that and all the beliefs. And he decided to take the opportunity. So what did he do? He took a stick, whatever he took, and he broke all the idols. And he left only one idol, big, big, fat, tall idol. He left, he put a stick in his hand, and that's all. And his father comes in the evening. Avram, what did you do? He starts yelling at him. 
why did you break all the idols? Why did you do this? Is my source of income and, and this, you're not allowed to break them. They're gods and went on and on and on. He says, dad, I didn't do anything. He said, what do you mean you didn't do anything? He said, you see this big idol that is standing here? They all started fighting. All the idols were fighting when you weren't here and they were arguing and, and bickering and so on. And the big idol got very angry and he decided to make order. So he took his stick. He said, you see the stick in his hands? He took the stick and he broke all the idols to pieces. I didn't do anything, dad. Why are you angry at me? And his father, Tara, started laughing. He said, do you think I'm a fool? These idols can't walk, can't talk, can't see. He couldn't take a stick and break all the idols. So he said, that's exactly what I was trying to tell you all these years, dad. If they cannot walk or talk or see or hear or listen, so why are you worshiping them? And you know the story, his father got upset, the whole thing. Anyway, Nimrod, the king then, who made himself to a king and he wanted to say that he was God, he got a hold of Avram and he decided to punish him. And he asked Avram, do you believe in me? Do you believe in this? He says, no, I don't. He said, do you believe? He says, I believe in the God that made heaven and earth. And you did not make heaven or earth. Can you stop the sun from setting? Can you stop this? And then, you know, obviously he couldn't answer that Nimrod. So they made a very, very big fire. It's very sad. And they decided, uh, Avram had no choice. They caught him. And he decided to throw him into the fire alive. And we know the amazing miracle that happened to Avram. Avram was ready to be thrown into the fire. He didn't know Hashem will save him. He believed it was his ideology. He believed, he knew that Hashem created the world, that there is a superpower, super being that we call Hashem. It's not idols. And unfortunately, Nimrod doesn't want to understand. And all the people in the world don't want to understand at that time. And they're going to throw him in the fire. What should he do? And, you know, they threw him into the fire. They threw later his brother. You know, we won't go into all the details because we're going to get late. But they threw Avram into the fire. And all of a sudden, what happened? By the way, those of you who ever watched Young Abraham, that video, it's very interesting because it brings the story a little bit to, to real life. They see that Avram is walking in the fire alive. And the Medrash says, the Torah tells us that obviously God did not want Avram to burn. And the fire moved away from him. Because the same God that created the fire, and he created the nature in the fire that fire consumes and fire burns, God forbid, eats everything around it. And if water comes, water can take it. The same God had changed that nature for Avram. And Avram was saved. And it says that tree grew there, like it was a garden. And, and everybody realized who Avram was, they let go of him. Avram was saved. And Avram was teaching, and Sarah were teaching thousands of people, wherever they traveled, wherever they were, they were in Haran then in that country, they were teaching everyone and explained to everybody that it doesn't make any sense to believe in idols, that God created the world, that you have to be justice, you have to be nice, you cannot be corrupt. And he was trying to teach people to be good civilians, to be good human beings, to be the way Hashem wants us to be. So you can imagine till the age of 75, Avram did everything on his own. God never appeared to him. He did everything the way he understood. And we can say it's not such a big deal because we know as well, there were many people, you know, uh, philosophers of this through the generations that unfortunately were killed because they believed in something and they knew it was true. And, 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 and then people told them, well, if you tell us you believe in, we're going to kill you. And they killed them because this was the, their idea. That's what they believe. Avram came to it with his own mind and he was ready to be burned. I mean, he didn't want to, obviously, but they threw him, they forced him. And he didn't say, okay, I don't believe in God because it was important to him. And that's what he believed in. So somebody who went with his own mind for so many years, all of a sudden, Hashem is coming to him and testing him. We know that Avram was tested with 10 tests. 10, I guess, with a nis nisyonot. Uh, nisayon in Hebrew is a test. It's also, nisayon is from the word nes, which is a miracle, and also nes to bring up. 
to put something very high because when we go through a test, we become stronger, we become higher. And here was the first test of Avram. Hashem appeared to Avram. His name was not Avraham yet. His name was Avram. Hashem appeared to Avram and Hashem tells him, Lech Lecha, go for yourself. And as we said before, Lech Lecha is really, Hashem said it to the first Jew and to the first Jewess, Avram and Sarai. And again, we don't say Sarah, it's Avram and Sarai. Later, Hashem changed their names. Hopefully, we'll have a chance to go to that. And Hashem said, go. And we're learning that we always have to go, always to go higher and higher. Why was it such a hard test? Besides the fact that Hashem told him, leave your land, leave your country, whatever, where you were born, whatever you were used to, leave your family, things that you're born with, that you're ready for, the food, everything, and go somewhere else. Really, Kabbalah explains, the Al-Tarebbe writes in the Mimer, he's saying that Hashem is saying that to every Jew, leave your own things, what you know, and go higher, go out of yourself, go to something higher. But why was it hard for Avram? Because here Avram always did everything that made sense to him. And he was an extremely intelligent, extremely smart person. And he did everything as a normal smart person would do. But Hashem wanted to bring him higher, to a higher level, to a level of a Jew. And what is our level? To do things higher than understanding. I'm going to try to explain more. Lemala, in Hebrew, we say it in, in, in Hasidus many times. Lemala mitam vadat. Tam means taste. But tam means like when you taste, you understand it, you feel it. And dat means knowledge. Higher than your knowledge. Higher than what you comprehend and you understand. Hashem wanted Avram to become godly. Before he was a very high human being. But he was as a human being. He was as a normal man, a very smart person that did a lot of good in the world. When at the age of 75, Hashem started testing him to see, to bring him to a higher level, to do things that are higher than our understanding, to be connected to Hashem as a Yid, that we do things that we don't always understand. And it was not easy for Avram to follow because Hashem did not tell him where to go. In the, the Chumash, the way the Chumash says, Vayomer Hashem al Avram, Lech Lecha, Go for yourself, go, but it'll be good for yourself. Later, you'll have benefit from it. As we said, leave your family, all the things you are used to, all the things that you did, that they were good things. You know, they weren't bad things. They were good things that you used to. But I want you to go now to a higher level. Not to do things, speaking to us, not to do things because we understand, but to go to a higher level of a yid, as we discussed last week, not just to be spiritual, this is not enough, but to be holy, to be godly. To be godly is to do what Hashem wants you to do. Hashem told Avram, you did everything the way you understood in your mind. Now you do things in a godly mind. You won't always understand everything, but you, be, you will become holier. You will become higher. And there will come a time that you will understand and you will become closer to Hashem. Where did Hashem tell him to go? El Haaretz Asher Eka, to the land that I will show you. Hashem didn't even tell him where to go. And this is very hard. This is very hard to anyone. When somebody tells you, you know, I want you to go to another country. I want you to go somewhere and it's going to be better for you there. You're going to have a better job. You know, immigrants that leave, that left their country where they were, they were doctors, there were nurses, there were lawyers, and then they come to a country that they don't know, they have to start everything from new. Nobody knows them. They're not the famous doctor that they were. I remember speaking to a, to a lady, I mean, she passed on already many years ago. She was elderly, you know, she was almost 100 when she passed. She was a judge back in Russia. She used to live in Calgary. We were very close friends. And she used to tell me that she was a, a judge back in Russia. She came here. I mean, she was already older. She wasn't in age really to go to work, but it was hard for her because she felt so incompetent. She didn't know English. She didn't know many things. And all of a sudden she's coming, you know, to a place starting everything from new. But imagine if people are immigrating and they don't even know where they're going. Now people even they say, okay, we're going to America. We're going to France. We're going to England. We're going to, to you know, to Canada, it'll be a better life there. It'll take a time, we, we fall, 
to fall back in order to leap forward, right? Might be hard for us to fall back a little bit. We have to be work as cleaning ladies. We have to be dishwashers. We have to do things like that till we learn the language. And we might not get the job that we really wanted because we're already older and we cannot master all the certificates and all the tests we have to go, but our children will benefit. So we leap, you know, our kids will have a better life because if we're in the country where we are, then God forbid our kids will not have a better life also. So we sacrifice, we fall back, but there will be something better. But at least you know where you're going. Avram did not know. That was another, like it was a hard test. Somebody who is not, who is used to follow orders, right? A child, okay, you tell, do this, do this. They're used to, they don't understand everything. But somebody who's very smart to tell them, go do something that is against your nature, you're not used to just following orders without understanding. And all of a sudden you're supposed to do things without understanding, it's not, it's not an easy task. And Hashem said it to Avram to do, and Avram did it. Now what happens? Avram is supposed to go to Eretz Canaan. He leaves Haran. He's supposed to go to the land of Canaan. He comes to the land of Canaan, which is Eretz Yisrael, right? He comes there, what happens? Another test, there is a famine. Ba'aretz, Hayarab. It was a famine. There was no food. So he had to go to Mitzrayim, to Egypt. What is Mitzrayim? Metzarim. Those of us who speak Hebrew, right? When we spoke about it with Shofar and so on, Metzarim means when you are confined, when something is hard, like a tzara. Mitzrayim is not, it's not open. It, it's a tzara. Mitzrayim it speaks when we don't know what we do ourselves. We have um, tests and so on and so forth. So here we are. Hashem is telling Avram, go to your, go lech lech, leave the country to the place that I'll show you. It will be good for you. And here it feels like Avram is falling back. He comes to a country and now he has to leave. It comes to Mitzrayim. And now as they're going to Mitzrayim, and this is all teaching us again a lesson in Avodat Hashem is serving Hashem. Many times we started a journey and it seems really nice and it's easy. I'm going, I'm going up, up. And then all of a sudden we have tests. And the test is not to pull us down, not to pull us back, God forbid. It's a test from Hashem to see how strong we'll be. But when we overcome the test, we become much stronger. We leap forward. We get so much stronger in the thing. And we're going to soon bring some examples from our own life. And all of us can think, uh, understand it as well. We become stronger as we were before. Because now there was a test. Before it was easy for me to keep kosher. Because I was in Eretz Israel. I was in Eretz Canaan. I was in the place that it was easy. It was easy. I lived in Toronto. I lived in Montreal. I lived in Israel. <clears throat> It was so easy. It, it, I had to go out of my way, you know, like when we go to Sobeys, uh, some of you know, in Toronto, there's a Sobeys by Clark there next to Israel's, whatever, in the Jewish area, that you have to look to buy something not kosher. I don't know if they have something not kosher. Maybe Risha will tell us. Maybe they have a small section, but everything is kosher. The takeout, the this, everything. It, it's amazing. It's like an oasis for me to go there and go there with the kids. Mom is, I said, you don't have to ask. Everything has a kosher sign. Everything is kosher. It's, it, it's, it's, a lot of people come from Calgary. It's amazing. So over there to keep kosher in Toronto, not to say that all the Eden in Toronto keep kosher. They're trying, I'm sure. But over there, it's much easier. And people in Calgary tell me many times, oh, if I live in Toronto, I would keep kosher. Maybe yes, maybe not. We always think that, the, the green, the, the grass is always green on the other side, it looks greener, right? You get closer to the neighbor, oh, it doesn't look as green anymore. Um, but obviously it's easier and could be if you live there, you would keep kosher. I live in Toronto, I keep kosher. You come to Calgary and it's harder. This is a test from Hashem. You feel I fall back. I, I go to the store and I have to look and then the meat sometimes doesn't look so fresh or not like how it looks and it's expensive. And, <laughs> And all the reasons we know, and it's hard to find. It is. It's much harder. In Toronto, you go, you want to eat out. There's kosher restaurants, kosher this, kosher that. And here, you know, when we moved here, before Sobis was here, I remember in 88, 89, when we moved here, boy, girls, it was hard. It was a hard test. And I remember people telling us, uh, some teacher, actually, <clears throat> he moved. 
many years back already he used to teach in Akiva. Our kids didn't go to Akiva at the time, you know, our kids were, Yossi was four months and Hani was a year and three months, you know, they're 11 months apart, my two older ones, they were babies. But, you know, obviously we got to know people. And that person told my husband, he told the rabbi, he says, you know, I also was religious like you when I moved here. I used to wear the long black coat and I used to keep Chalav Israel. I used to keep, uh, you know, Chalav Israel, it's kosher milk, but it's milk only that was, all their products were only uh, milked when that a Jew was watching it. It's in a higher level. I can maybe explain another time what it is and so on. It's just higher level of things. He said, I also used to do it, but it's very hard. And I just stopped. I stopped, stopped wearing the short jacket on Shabbos. I started wearing this. I mean, it's okay. You don't have to wear a long jacket uh, every time. But he was just, he just told my husband certain things I stopped because it's much harder. It's not New York. It's not Toronto. It's Calgary. And I remember my husband looked him in his eyes and he said, you know, you can come anytime, a day at night or night, and you can open up my fridge and my cupboards and the food and the fridge is for the meal, for dairy products. And you will never find, God forbid, something that is not going to be on the same high level as if I lived in Toronto or in Los Angeles or, you know, any other big place. But it was much harder. I remember there were times that we went on... You know, we used to buy powdered milk and we used to buy, I mean, those time there wasn't a lot of, you know, choices till my husband found a farm. We used to go to get milk from a farm. And I don't know if I ever shared that with you. And I, I felt girls that I went back generations. I felt like I was my grandma. You know, I mean, I remember I was a little kid, you know, when we lived in Moscow a lot, but I remember hearing stories, you know, they would go and milk the cow and then, um, pasteurize it, and you know, I bought a thermometer you can put in the in the pot, and it's the pasteurize the, the milk. And and it was like I said, where did I come to live? I live in Canada, but it is, because you know it was very costly to ship everything from Montreal, from Toronto, the the cholesterol milk. Some years later, we had more families that started becoming you know more careful with that stuff and became more religious. So we started ordering for many people. We were ordering for us as well. I remember just funny that it comes to mind. I remember I used to say that the milk smells like a cow because it was like real, you know, and it was very thick. And we used to go, my parents lived at the time in Los Angeles. So we used to go visit, obviously, from time to time. And I remember the first time probably when we came, I said, Ma, the milk is so watery. And she bought the red milk, you know, the three and a half percent milk for the kids. And she started laughing because she was used to, she lived in Russia much longer than I did. So she knew what, when you milk, you know, the, the original milk from the cow, it's very thick, right? And then it um, separates. I learned how to make my own yogurt and my own everything. You know, really, I felt like I was a great grandma, but it was an interesting time in our life. Um, you, you learn to appreciate to go to the store, and pick up ready yogurt and ready milk in a carton and that, you know, in those big bases, you know, and then it's spilled in the car and the car spilled. We had all, that, all our stories. So she says, oh, because you are used to having milk from the cow. That's why you think that this milk is watery. But, you know, anyway, obviously they separated, right? Because that's how they can make the other things. So I'm saying, obviously, it's much harder. So you think, well, I'm coming to Calgary, I'm going down to a certain extent in 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 in, um, in Yiddishkeit you can go down God forbid but obviously Baruch Hashem I would hope that we went up and all of you went up because every time we do something it's much harder you, you you continue to go down but you really go higher because you have to be so strong it's a test from Hashem because here it's much harder to eat kosher you're standing in in uh, Disneyland I remember we used to go visit and it's a hot day and you want to, well, you want to drink, but the popcorn smells so good or, or the other food. I remember as a child, as a teenager, as a child, we were 16 when I went to LA, we lived in, in California for eight years. And you stand in those amusement parks and I tell you, it smells so good. And you have all the campers with you and, oh, can we buy this? Can we buy that? And you say, no, we are eating. We keep kosher. We brought the food. We have the food with us, but this we can buy. Some things we can buy, some things we can't buy. And it just makes you be, a strong person because you know that this is this what it is and that's what Hashem was teaching Avram and from that Hashem was teaching us because Avram was the first Jew that now at the age of 75 Hashem started teaching him Hashem told him Hashem tested him Hashem told him to do things that he doesn't really understand yet 
it will come a time that you'll understand. And that's what we are. Many things, when we start learning Torah, we start doing things, we don't always understand what Hashem is telling us to do. We don't always understand what difference does it make when I light candles and I don't light candles. We understand now much more than our grandparents understood or great-grandparents understood because we study Hasidus. Hasidus is based on Kabbalah, on the Zohar. And that's the inner part of the Torah. That's the neshama, that's the soul of the Torah. So we understand, we understand the mitzvahs of the Torah so much more than our great-grandparents understood. They perhaps did more than us. I'm sure they did. They were very special people, but they did not know all the answers why and where and, how, and, how, and not how they did, but why. We understand now more than why, so it's easier, more why, I'm saying. So it's easier for us to keep many things, and, and, but we need it. We need to understand why because we are in a lower generation that if we want to understand why it's not enough just to say well do it because i told you so but yeah you, you do it we tell children to do it and we try to explain this is not the generation that we tell kids just do because i said so we do have to explain i had just some analogy i wanted to say and it slipped out of my mind maybe it will um maybe it will come it will come back something with understanding what we're doing so here Avram is tested with that test. Then he goes to, to Egypt. And then when they go to Egypt, as we know, Avram all of a sudden tells Sarah, now I know that you're a beautiful woman and we have to do something about it. And we know that whole story, we won't go into all the details why, could be, we'll discuss it next week. But as we know that Avram told Sarah, we're going to Egypt. The people in Egypt are not used to seeing beautiful, a beautiful person, a beautiful woman like you. And it's known that, our, that Sarah obviously was a very beautiful person within, with all the mitzvot, with all the commandments, all the things that she kept, that she was such a good, good person, that she was very beautiful, very royal, and, um, and just a very elegant, beautiful woman, like a queen. And he says, I'm afraid, and when we'll get there, they will see you, and they're going to want to take you to the king. They will say, oh, such a beautiful woman. She has to become the queen. She has to go to Paro. And if, if they will know that we are married, then they're going to tell, they're going to kill me because they're not going to want to take you because you're married to me. So they're going to kill me and they're going to take you because now if, I, if I'm dead, then you're a single woman and they're going to take you to the king. So please say that you are my sister. It was not a lie because they, they were brother and sister. Those years, they would marry more than one wife. They had the same father. They were allowed. It was for the giving of the Torah and so on. And anyway, Avram and Sarah's parents were not following, actually, <laughs> the laws of the Torah anyway. But the, the sons of Noah, they were allowed then to do that. So they had the same father, not the same mother. And uh, he said, say that I'm, you see, please say that I, you are my sister. And this way I'll be saved. And um, I learned, I read a lot about it. Uh, next week's class, we're gonna be speaking about Sarah. Actually, I do wanna tell you girls that we are changing our system with sending emails and we don't wanna send too many emails if we don't have to. So we decided that either Thursday night or Friday morning, we're gonna send an email that will have all the classes, all the things that we can think of that we know now for the following week. So feminine conversation as well, we're not gonna be sending it again every Thursday morning. Please look at the email that will come either tonight or tomorrow morning early. And that will have the, will have the topic that we'll have next week. So if you forget where to sign in and so on, you'll see the, the email that you got this week. So, so I have to think today what we're gonna be teaching next week. We're gonna be learning about Sara Emanu, our matriarch Sara. There's so many special things that happened in her life. And uh, there were a lot of commenters that go, how was Avram able to say such a thing? In order he should be saved, he is letting Sarah to be abducted by such immoral people. And God forbid, to, to, something so terrible can happen to her. He wasn't like, he didn't care for her. He cared for his life, that he should be saved and, and so on and so forth. And, and there, there are a lot, a lot of questions. And, Obviously, Avram cared very much for Sarah, and this is one of the great things that Sarah had, that the Zohar tells us, 
the Zohar, the Kabbalah, Rabbi Shimon Bar Chai wrote that Avram saw that Sarah had this big Kedushab, holiness. She had so much power, much higher than he had. And he knew, he saw in his prophetic vision that nothing is going to, nobody can harm her. Nobody's going to touch her. Nothing can happen to her. And that's why he said what he said, but we can learn probably discuss next week why he said sister, what is a sister and a brother in a relationship. Very interesting the way um, our commenters explain. So to make the long story short, it was still a fall down. It was still sad. It was still for those 10 hours or five hours or whatever when Sarah was taken away because they did come to the border and everything happened exactly what Avram thought. He said, oh, who is that beautiful woman? She's your wife. She is this and that. Oh, she's my sister. Okay, let's take her to the king. And it says, obviously, Sarah was taken and they gave Avram presents and stuff. They said, oh, you have such a beautiful sister. You let us take her and so on. Nobody was able to touch Sarah. Sora was so holy and so pure and so special that Hashem would not allow anyone to make her, God forbid, not pure to anyone, even to touch her or anything like that. She was a married woman. She was a Jewish woman and, and Paro wasn't allowed and she didn't deserve, God forbid, for Paro to touch her. And it says if Paro, the Torah tells us that Paro tried to get close to her and he got, um, he got a very bad sickness right away and everybody in his kingdom as well. And it was in, um, if I may, in the, in the place in his body where we have intimate relationships. And he understood it was because of sorrow because anytime he would try to get close to her, the, the, the malach, the angel was watching and he, and he didn't allow, you know, he had pain and he understood and everybody else and so on. So he understood that something is wrong. Why is it happening? It never happened to him. Probably this woman is a very holy woman, very special woman, and he cannot. So they went back right away. They, they, the servants brought her back to Avram. And they said, why did you say that she's your, sorry. Sorry, it's my daughter. I'll just tell her in the class. Chayestek, I've been in class. It's the Komish Petar Keshinkat. That's okay, I love you. I love you, back. Um, they got very, they were angry at Avram. said, why did you say that she's uh, your sister? She's really your wife? Because basically the angel told the power, you know, let go of her, she's a married woman and so on. And then they send them away because Par was afraid. Later on happened again that um, another matriarch was taken away also by a king, but then the king said, no, no, stay here, Avimelech with Sarah with Avimelech, but Paro said to Avram, go for my country, because he said, my people, the Muslim people, I guess, that live in Egypt, he said, they're very angry people, and they will want to take revenge. So I don't want you to stay here, because they might hurt you, and then I'm going to get hurt, because I'm the king. So, you know, just go away. But anyway, it was not, it was a test. And like I said, Hashem saved Sarah, Avram, no Hashem will test, um, save Sarah, and Avram would not have say something like that, you know, would not, God forbid, put her in danger, but, but he knew, as we said, that she had this holiness in front of her. It says that the Imahot, the prophetess, the matriarchs, Sarah, Rivka, Rochel, and Leah, were higher in, um, in prophecy than the forefathers, and Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And they, their vision was higher. They were able to see in many, in, in the holiness, even, even more than the, than our forefathers. So here we're discussing what Avram and Sarah are going. It seems to us like they, I'm trying to see what else we wanted to accomplish. There's so much what to say, um, so much what to learn. And as we said, they went from one test to another, but the test made them higher, made them stronger, made them be more connected to Hashem. It says, um, Avram lived for many years. Avram had two um, periods in his life. Till the age of 75, he was in Haran. As we said, he lived with his own mind. He did amazing things. He taught people about godliness, about believing in one God, about being just, about being good people. 
did everything with his own mind. The second period in his life was when he was in Canaan, when he lived in Israel, right? When he was going down. And now Hashem was telling him, as we said, to listen to him, to do things that don't necessarily make sense to bring him to the higher level. What does it mean to bring him to the higher level? To bring him to the level that Avram should be able to be and Sarge be able to be the father and mother of our nation. He should be able to leave us a legacy. He should be able to build the nation of the Jewish people. What does it mean to build the nation of the Jewish people is to be connected to Hashem, to be godly, as we said, to be holy. How? Tzivui, Hashem tziva, Hashem commanded him, leave your, leave your place, go to the land. Tzivui, mitzvah, and as we see, every word in Hebrew, in Torah, in the biblical Hebrew, I mean, modern Hebrew, we have many new words that come from the English lexicon and so on, which is okay, that's the Hebrew, but it's not, you know, like psychology, we say psychologia, right? Uh, TV, television is televisia, you know, like those words, this is modern Hebrew words. I'm talking about Hebrew language the way it is. Sivui is commandment. I command you. Mitzvah, from the same word, when we do a mitzvah, we fulfill the tzivui, the commandment of God. Mitzvah is also from the word tzavta. Tzivui, mitzvah, tzavta vechibur. Tzavta vechibur, chibur means to be connected. Tzavta vechibur means when you, be, when you are connected, when you are with someone else, when you become like one, you are connected with someone. What does it mean? When we do a mitzvah, we get connected with Hashem we get holy. I'll try to explain it. Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Rochelea, our forefathers, it's known that they kept the Torah, all the Torah on their own. They knew in their prophetic vision, they knew the mitzvot of the Torah, although the Torah wasn't given yet. The Torah was given the time of Moshe when they were in the desert. We had Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, the 12 tribes, and they went to Egypt. They were there slaves for 210 years. It took many years till the Jewish people got the Torah. But they knew it in their prophetic vision, and they kept the Torah. They kept the mitzvot. But the mitzvot, they did it on their own. So it was, in a way, like a smell. It was like a good smell. When you smell, you smell something, you perfume. You say, smell, it's nice, but then it disappears. It dissipates. It's not like something that you eat. It becomes part of you. It becomes part of you. That's why it's so important to eat kosher because part of us, it affects us. How we think, what we say, what we do. I want to mention something now about that it becomes part of us. And many of us have young children, the girls that are here and so on. Um, I remember uh, hearing a, a story a true story that was with the, with the Rav where I lived in Israel, Nechlat Ar Chabad, Kirat Malachi, had a, I think it was a child of his that didn't want to put on a yarmulke. It was a three-year-old. He didn't like putting a yarmulke, he put it down every time, and he bothered the parents. And uh, they wrote to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe said, check what the child is eating. Well, they were keeping kosher, but there was some formula, some food they were giving that was coming from the States. And they found out that it could have been a, a better kosher sign than it was, whatever. It was not Chalav Israel, And that, obviously, it's in a spiritual sense. But when we eat kosher, when we say blessings, when we do all those things, we become more purified. We're purifying ourselves. So we also want to have good things. We want to think well. You know, person, if you, if you want to be an intelligent person, the more you learn, you become more intelligent. We tell the children, you want to be a clean person, you have to clean yourself. Then you realize people who are fortunately homeless, or you know, they don't shower, they don't even realize, they probably don't even smell, I'm sorry to say, their own filth, because there's so much in it, they don't even smell, smell it anymore. But when you are very clean and you're, you know, you can feel if something is not the right thing. You tell child, learn more. The more you learn, your brain is more, you know, you become more intelligent and so on and so forth. How much more so when it comes to kosher food, to learn, we have to, our job is to make our body holy, to make our body godly. 
That's why we do mitzvot with our bodies, not just thinking as we were saying, it's not good enough to be a Jew in the heart. We have to be a Jew. It's the same thing you say, I'm a, I'm a good person in my heart. I'm exercising in my heart. I know I have to exercise. I know I have to eat. <laughs> if you're not gonna eat, you're not gonna exercise. <laughs> God forbid, you're not gonna take actual showers. What's gonna be with you? We have to do actual mitzvot. When you do actual mitzvot, you become holy. Avram, Yitzchak, they did all the mitzvot, but it was, I can't say superficial, but it did not penetrate in the world here because Hashem did not command them to do it and it did not make the world um, holy. Let me explain. Yaakov, later on, will learn that Yaakov put on film. What do you mean Yaakov put on film? He did not put on film that we know that the man put on the hand and on the head that film. It's a very, very special mitzvah that men have to do. Not us, but men have to do. We have other mitzvah that we do. And he did, he, how did he put on film? He says he put on film when he used to be a shepherd. He put, he used to, you know, he cover, um, if you remember from perhaps from other years that he colored the sheep, you know, with black uh, dots, black lines. It, it says, it Dora explained, that's how he, what do you mean he put on film? What you have to accomplish when you put on film, what you have to meditate, what you have to think. He did it when he was being a shepherd, he did it with the stick. Did the stick become holy? No. He was able to throw away the stick later. God forbid, when you have to film, when you have a prayer book, I have the Torah here, I have the Chumash here, it's paper. Is it holy? It was not holy before when it was a piece of paper, it wasn't holy. But once you take the paper and you write on it, you type and you write on it Hashem's name, you write on it Torah, you write on it blessings, you write on it holy things, the paper becomes holy. And that's what happened. That's what Hashem was making Avram getting ready. Hashem told him, Lech Lecha, go to yourself. Go from the things you are used to. You are used to doing things in your own mind as a human being. I want you to become godly, close to me, making things in this world holy and go to your oneness. Hashem is telling it to, to, each, and, to each and every one of us. Lech Lecha. Walk, get higher, lech lecha, go in, in you, in your own soul, in your own neshama. Try to go higher. Try to become uh, on a higher level to what you really can accomplish. Um, girls, I don't know how much more we can speak. I want to mention something else. And, um, and that's why... God, is going by. And the reason... I did just so much what to say. The reason that um, and the only mitzvah, I'm sorry, that Avram did, I want to mention that it's in this parsha when Avram did the, the mitzvah of the bris. Why didn't Avram make a bris to himself if he did all the other mitzvot? He waited once Hashem started speaking to him, he did it in the, in the, in the age of uh, 99, because the other mitzvot, once Hashem told him to do it, when he did it, it was on a much higher level, right? Because tzavta v'chibur, get connected to Hashem. Also, when you do things voluntarily, it's much easier to get volunteers than to tell people what to do. And many times you think, well, I volunteered. It's, it's so special. It's true. When you volunteer, it's special. But when you are told to do something, you right away have that mechanism to say, no, we know it with children, we know it with ourselves too. When I feel like making a surprise for my spouse, a surprise for somebody, I'm excited because it's my own initiative and I feel like doing it. Avram believed that there is one God and he was ready to be burnt into the fire because that was his ideology, he understood it. But all of a sudden when Hashem comes and tells him go somewhere, you don't even know where to, why, what will be. I, I'm going to lose my money. I'm going to lose this. Nobody knows me there. It's going to be hard. I'm already old. I'm already 75. Doesn't make any sense. That was hard to listen. He had to listen. You right away, you right away. That was such a big test because when somebody tells us what to do, we right away don't want to listen. That's why it's at, you know, a higher level. Avram couldn't do a breeze twice. You can put fill another time, you can do you can kosher, but once you do a breeze, you do it once, you can't do it a second time. And, and Hashem did it, Hashem wanted to tell Avram, that was the first mitzvah also, that you do a breeze in your body. So Hashem wanted to teach us to tell him that we become 
holy. When we do mitzvot, we become holy. We become one part of it with Hashem. It's, it's, it's a mark in our body. And mm -hmm. we might ask why women don't have to do a bris. Because we are born, that's what the Torah says, we are born already perfect. Hashem could have made men also born without that uh, skin, without the, the foreskin, and they would be born perfect. Sometimes it happens. Moshe Rabbein was born, didn't have to have a breeze. At times it happens that, that babies are born, people are born without the foreskin. Most people are born with it. Hashem created us in such a way that we already, we don't have to go through that stage to get perfect. We have a name right away. When girls are born, we right away given a name when we read the Torah, either a Monday or a Thursday mm -hmm. or a Shabbos, or if it's a holiday or a Chodesh, then we give a name to a girl by the Torah reading. A boy, you have to wait till you make a bris because when you give a name, you bring down a higher level of the neshama after the child is born, even a higher level when you give a name. A girl gets it right away. She doesn't have to go through physical thing. Boys have to wait and then they get it. And then the full part of the neshama, if I want to say the highest, we get at the age of bas mitzvah and bar mitzvah, the age of 12 for girls, the age of 13 for boys. Whether we had a party or didn't have a party, it doesn't matter. That's, that's what happened at that age that we have that. And, and sometimes we don't recognize it, but we have it and we have that ability and so on and so forth. I want to mention also that today is a very special day and we spoke a lot about Avram and how we can we go down in order to go up. We, you know, we had many examples. We spoke about it many times about the corona that we go down. We, we're not with people, but we go up. So many of us learn more and do many things like that. You know, in many, in many things we know, you know, sometimes you, we have a, God forbid, a fight uh, with someone and then we feel we go down. And then once we get back to a track, we become even higher, we become the higher level and we make a mistake and then we become a higher level when we say sorry or with ourselves, you know, we, we, we can always, we always go higher after if we might learn from our mistake. But today is a your side of a very special woman, Rachel Imenu, Rachel Armeitriak, the 11th of Cheshvan. She passed away in the 11th of Cheshvan. Perhaps you saw, I'm sure many of you saw on, on, on Facebook and this, you know, many people were saying many, many women, I joined a group I got this morning that they tried, hopefully they were succeeded, to finish the Tehillim 5,000 times today with all the women around the world. So everybody took a Yamim of Tehillim to say days of Tehillim, just to pray, Sarah Lamin should pray to Hashem to finish the plagues, to finish all the sorrow, to bring Mashiach and so on and so forth. We know that Rachel was not buried in the place where uh, in Me'arat HaMachpala, where the forefathers were, where Yaakov was buried with Avram, Yitzchak, and all of that, she was buried in Bethlehem, and the Jewish people went through her place to Davin. Um, I think this, uh, in a few parshas, we're going to be learning about uh, the whole marriage of Yaakov, Rachel, and Leah, and I think we should dedicate a time to learn um, about Rachel more. And I do want to mention that one thing that we learned from Rachel, so, so, such a amazing quality and it's not right not to mention because the days are your set and even though it's already night still before we go to sleep and we say Shema we want to think how we can learn from her mm -hmm. and um, I know I'm named after my great aunt but obviously the first Rachel uh, my name is Rachel the first Rachel was Rachel Imenu and it's always a very special name to me and a special lesson that we have just looking at the time mm -hmm. Rachel and Yaakov were in love mm -hmm. and they knew that they'll marry each other for seven years. That's a long time. It's a very long time. As we know, mm -hmm. Yaakov mm -hmm. went to Lavan when he ran away and he met Rochel on the well mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And Lavan did not want, mm -hmm. Yaakov never wanted to marry more than one wife. Yaakov wanted to marry Rachel. Mm -hmm. And he and Lavan said, no, I'm not gonna give you my daughter just like that so easy. He was a terrible man. He was his uncle, but, you know, Lavan was a terrible man. Anyway, he told him, you have to work for me for seven years to earn to marry my daughter. You know, it's like he was selling his daughters. But anyway, to make the long story short, as we know, um, Lavan was a terrible man and he was a cheater. He was known as a cheater, Lavan Haramai. And he decided to 
in Leah, he said Rachel was younger, it's not right, Leah should marry first, and so on and so forth. Now, I know it's, it's very hard to imagine, but Rachel and Yaakov for seven years waited to marry each other. Mm. And here, and obviously they didn't do anything mm. before. They didn't touch nothing, nothing. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's Torah. They were mm. very special people and very high people. And here, Rachel was afraid that something is going to happen because she knew her father. And she told Yaakov, Yaakov, you know, I'm afraid that, that last one. minute, my father is going to put a trick. He's going to do something. And you know what? Let's give each other signs. And under the chuppah, because my face will be covered, you will not see, you will not know who the girl is. And actually from there is the minhag, the custom came that before you go to the chuppah, right? The chasen kami unveils the kala. Well, looks who she is and then he felt to make sure that she is the right girl that he's marrying. And they gave each other signs. And then as it came closer to the day of the wedding, day before, whatever that was, um, obviously Rachel knew that she cannot change her father's um, decision and so on and so forth. And now her sister was going to marry Yaakov and not her. Just if we think about it, we don't have a lot of time, but it wasn't just a nice love between Yaakov and Rochel, a romantic seven years waited. Obviously, they had a physical life too. I mean, physical love and so on, and they were great people. But Rochel knew who Yaakov was, and Yaakov knew who Rochel was. They're, they're, I mean, they were both, Rochel was, says, Yifat Tor, Yifat when she was a very beautiful, beautiful woman, beautiful girl. But not just the physical, the beauty that she had inside of her and what she represented and so on. Because um, it speaks about the first time Yaakov saw Rachel, it said that he, on the well, he came over and he kissed her. And it explains what a kiss means and what Yaakov represents, the Zohar, the, the Chassid is explaining what Rachel represents and the Shamas and, and everything and so on. And here she knew Yaakov is going to build the Jewish nation, Avram Yitzchak Yaakov. She wanted to be that one that will build the Jewish nation. She wanted to be with Yaakov. Perhaps at the time she did not know that Yaakov is gonna marry all these women. I mean, her sister and then the other ones and, and you weren't allowed to marry two sisters and so on. There were, there were so many. And she was ready to give all of it up to give her marriage to Yaakov in order not to embarrass her sister because she knew if she is, uh, her father is not gonna change his mind if she's not going to give those signs to her sister, then Yaakov is going to stop the whole ceremony right away and say, well, that's not the girl because she won't know what to answer in whatever system, whatever things they spoke and so on and so forth. There are many explanations on that. She just don't have the time to go into all of it. And in order for her, for her sister not to be embarrassed and not to be humiliated, she was ready to give up everything. And this is such an amazing quality. Like, it's so hard. You know, I know that girls are for years, that story. And I can say the older I get, the more I understand. I remember I was understanding, it started to understand a little bit more when I was engaged. And, you know, I wasn't engaged for very long, not seven years, six weeks, seven weeks. We did the wedding very quickly. And uh, thank God we did. <laughs> At the time I didn't want, my mother said, it's going to be very hard for you. <laughs> you know, I think goodness we did it quick. And um, mm -hmm. and I started thinking, I mean, I did not know Menachem for a long time then, two weeks, three weeks, whatever. It was getting close to the wedding. Obviously, it was harder and harder to wait and so on and so forth. And we were so in love and so this. And I, I couldn't fathom. I mean, they waited seven years and, and she was ready to give up not to, for her sister not to be embarrassed, for her sister not to be ashamed, for her sister to have a good life. This is something that is so hard. The older we get, we can understand the sacrifice that's, that Rachel did. And because of that, when she was buried in Bethlehem and with the Jewish people, we know the song called Baraman Ishma, you know, that Rachel is crying for her children. What does it mean when the Jewish people went to exile? And they went through, and they went through, uh, they were going to Bavel and they were suffering, mur murdered, and all of that. It was terrible, terrible. When it was like a, we spoke about many times, both destruction of the Beit Hamikdash was like 
like a Holocaust uh, times, I don't know what, God forbid. And Rochel went to Davin to Hashem. Everybody Davin, all the great people Davin to God. They said, look what is happening. Please save the Jewish people. And who Hashem listened to? To Rochel. They said, Hashem told Rochel, don't worry. They will come back and I'll give Israel back to the Jewish people and they'll live there again and so on. Because when Rochel went up to pray to Hashem, she said, look what I have done. I give everything away. I give everything up. All my dreams of my life, I gave up in order not to embarrass my sister. So how can you do this to my children? And so on and so forth, the whole conversation she had, you know, with Hashem. So I know I'm not giving justice because we're not going through the whole story in all the details, just in short, but I wanted to bring up for Shabbos, you know, that because today is her yard set, that we learn from her um, not to forgive. She wasn't upset at her sister, but to give up in order not to humiliate someone. How many times we don't give up, but we are so easy to hurt someone. Um, and many times is the, the, the people who you love most, you hurt most, right? The same goes because we feel, we don't feel, we feel close and we can yell. I can yell at my child. I can't yell at somebody else's child. Why? <laughs> It hurts when you yell at someone. So why do you pick up your voice at your own child? This is your child. The closest thing to you, you yell at. You put them down. But somebody else's child, you're afraid. You won't. Like, you know, when we think about it, how amazing she was. That she, you know, she, she gave up so much not to humiliate someone. Let's think the things that we do. How we speak to our spouses. How we speak to our friends. How we speak to our children. You know, I remember being in New York, those conventions that we go to once a year, you know, such Luchot. We had a, we had a, um, a lecture, he was a psychologist and a rabbi as well. And he said something very um, profound. He said, say, he was speaking about husband and wife because, you know, we work together, many of us, and many times it's very difficult. He said, say what you mean, but you don't have to be mean. I hope I'm saying it the right with my uh, accent. When you want to say something, say what you mean. Say what is on your mind, what you mean. But don't be mean. Don't be rude. Don't be bad. Many times we want to say something we say in a bad way that puts the other person down. Let's try to learn that from Rachel. Not only she did not hurt someone else, she tried. She gave up so much of her own life. Later on, she obviously did marry Yaakov and so on, but she gave up so much. Why? Not to embarrass her sister. And this is not to embarrass someone else. And this is something so profound that we're learning. Um, I wanted to say also, girls, some reminders, if I may, um, you'll look at the email that you'll get that Sunday, we're starting again the Tanya class with Rabbi Matasov. It's at 11.30. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. It's going to be 11 o'clock, not 11.30. It's going to be 11 o'clock. And I think it's going to be on um, Facebook, but you will see it on the email that you'll be getting. And Monday night, we're starting a new, perhaps you already know as well, new GLI course um, about Mashiach, the purpose of exile. And we had um, dedicated that class to the memory of my mother-in-law, because our yours it was last week. So we uh, did it for my mother-in-law, Pesia Bas, um, you were delayed. So that will be great. And you'll see it all in the email. So girls, I want to wish all of us a good week. Good Shabbos. Um, we didn't get to, to go through all the things, but I think we discussed a lot. And God willing, next week, we will discuss the life, uh, as much as we can, the life of Sora Emanu. So amazing what a real Jewish woman is. How much respect Avram gave her. How much respect God gave her. So many things that it will be so good for us to know, not to feel that we are superior to men or we're not superior. That's not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to learn to see our abilities and our true essence and, and what Hashem expects from us and what Hashem wants from us and how amazing it is to see in our matriarch Sarah, the first Jewish woman, what she was. And we'll discuss it next week, God willing. Um, I want to wish everyone a good Shabbos. I'm trying to see if there is... I mean, there's many things that we couldn't do, but hopefully it was a, a lot of, I think a lot of info, a lot of what to think about. Hopefully it was interesting. 
And, uh, and our Torah is amazing. Our Torah is amazing. And the more we do, the more we want to do more. The more we have the quest to learn more, to do more, to become more godly like Avraham and do the things whether we understand or we don't understand because we know that Hashem is telling us. That's what Hashem told Avraham, Lech Lecha. Go to yourself, go. Sometimes you go, you do things that you don't understand, but it's really to bring you up. You have tests, but it brings you up to make you stronger. As we said, you keep coaching Calgary, it's much harder because you want to buy this, you want to buy that. Oh, I did want to share with you that joke. I know that it's already time is off, class is out, but whoever wants you get that joke, a story that happened, but it's in a cute way. Rabbi, with children, it'll be a nice way to finish it up. Tell us the joke. Um, Rabbi, I'm sorry, what? Tell us the joke. Okay, the joke is a good thing to, to learn from. Rabbi Manis Friedman is saying that one time he was in a store. Sorry? Um, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to try to do that quickly. He was in a store, in a supermarket, and he saw an African-American woman um, walking with her child. And the child was nagging to buy whatever, some food, whatever. And she kept on saying to the child, oh, it's not kosher, it's not kosher. So he was like, he, he thought it was like very interesting. He didn't think she was Jewish. Uh, so he, but he said he'll ask her, like he was surprised, she knows what kosher is. So he told her, um, excuse me, madam, uh, are you Jewish? She said, no, I'm not. So if I'm asking, why are you asking uh, them if they're, why are you telling your child it's not kosher? She says, oh, because, you know, it was in New York, a lot of Jewish people in the area. And she says, I always see parents uh, with the kids and the kids nag them, buy me this, buy me that. And when the parents say it's not kosher, they stop nagging. They <laughs> don't ask again. So I'm trying to do it with my child as well. <laughs> It's a very, very good lesson, the girls. I know it sounds like a good joke. A good, it's a good story. It's not a joke. It's a good story. It's a very good lesson because children know and we know what is right and what is wrong. And I, I know that my children very much. Mm-hmm. In the store, even the child is a three-year-old. A two-year-old. I go, they want to buy the candy. Uh, on the What's the lesson? What's that's right. They won't even ask a second time. Never. Yeah, Never yeah. happened. Oh, yeah. That's they a good period. Ask. They'll ask, is this kosher? They'll go to other <laughs> items to ask. But they'll you. never ask again because they know that it's not something that you speak about. This is a baba. Mm-hmm. This is something that mommy did not make the rule. Because when we grow up in our the real, this is Hashem's Torah. They become godly. They become spiritual. They become holy. When we go to Toys R Us, oh boy. Yeah. Uh, no, but please, but I remember with Brock, we used to go. She would persuade me. I bought her probably $30. The kids would always laugh at me, my oldest, my oldest, my older children, because she was a baby for a long time. I think Judy came when she was like four and a half. And I loved her to pieces. I love all my kids to pieces. And so every time she explained to me why I have to buy that doll, because the, the 10 dolls she has at home, the 20 dolls, it's not the same, whatever. So they would explain to me, no, please, and please this. And they would go on and on because I was engaged in conversation. They knew it's okay. But when you say it's not kosher, it's out of question because it's not a rule that I made. And that's what Hashem was teaching here to Avram. Lech lecha. Go from the things you are used to and go to a higher level. Go become godly. I'm keeping this. I know it's the right thing. So I'm in a store and I'm very hungry. It's poison. I can't buy it. It's, it's, it's not... It's not, I mean, unless it's life and death, somebody needs the food, obviously. I'm not talking about that, but I just feel like it. So buy something else because it's, that's how you become godly. I become closer to Hashem. I do things that are higher than me. And then when it comes times, I don't feel like honoring my parents and I don't feel like doing this. I don't feel like doing this. I'm still going to do it because I do it because Hashem said, not with my own mind. Like Hashem told Avram, right? Avram till the age of 75 did everything on his own. And now Hashem tells him to do things. You have to do things when it's godly. When it's because many times we want to do things because we understand, but it's really the wrong thing to do. Thank goodness all of us around here are good people, I would hope. But the people got to do our murderers, the people who are this, 
the Germans and the Nazis, they understood, they were so intelligent. And they understood in their mind that the only people that have to stay on planet Earth are the Germans, not black, not Jews, not Spanish, not this, not this, everybody is, because that's the way I understood. They want the world to be pure, clean, only blonde hair and blue eyes and white skin and all the Michigais and unfortunately that they had. And they were very intelligent and they used their technology to murder people in the most because they went with their seichel. And that's very dangerous. We have to go with God's seichel because there always comes time in life that we think we understand and in our thing, we think yeah, it's okay, it's okay to do it. And then we always have to think twice. Is it because I want, or this is what God wants? Is that my heart or my brain? Is that really the right thing to do? Will God be happy? Is it godly? Is it holy? Or it just feels spiritual to me and I feel like doing it and I think it's a mitzvah. And when you really think, Hashem said, lech lecha, go to yourself. When you own, you know in your own neshama, in your own soul, you know what is right. And when you don't know, you know where to go for guidance, you know which book to open, you know who to call, who to ask to do the right thing. And let's hope that we should always be able to do the right choices. Hashem should help us to go lech lecha, go higher and higher and higher in all our, in our physical life, in our spiritual life, in all of our um, endeavors and everything that we do. And next week we'll learn more about Sarah, how she did it and how much we can learn from her. And as I said before, some of you uh, later later girls uh, will not going to be sending uh, reminders on Thursday, but hopefully you'll all remember and you'll be able to log in from the computer and we'll see whoever can join 11 o'clock the Tanya class and and the Moshiach class on Monday night at 7.30. Good job, I'm Good sorry. Good job, everybody. Thank you so much. Good job, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank everyone. Good job, everyone. Thank you. Good job, everyone. Oh, Hilda there. Nice see you all. Take care. Hilda there. Good job, everybody. Thank you so much. Hi, Rosie. Hi, how are you? I'm going to go, but girls, you can chat. Yeah, how to go, too. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Elisa. Danny, how are you? Fine, Yildale. What's the matter with you? What did you do? Yeah. You, you know, before Yom Tov, I called and I left a message. I spoke to you since then. I did. I spoke to you since then. I spoke to you since then. I spoke to you since then. Kimen, they they bring in the same build. Uh, Sarah's Sarah is my name is going to be in the 